From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Coming up, the magic city is going green. Transit industry, honestly, has been moving towards electrics for 15 years. Plus, criminals targeting flood victims. I'm surprised that this is happening. And details on a creepy discovery at Yellowstone National Park. All right, good morning and welcome to Montana this morning on this Friday, August 19th. New this morning, we have more alarming numbers to pass along to you about drugs coming into our state. Montana Drug Task Forces are on track to triple fentanyl seizures. We're learning how Montana's top law enforcement officer is arming the state against these massive drugs coming in. It, it, it is scary. There's really no way to describe it. We are finding this stuff everywhere. Words like unprecedented, alarming, and shocking almost seem too tame. Thousand percent plus increases, that, that's stunning. But the amount of new drugs coming into Montana is all of those things. The fentanyl trend is just getting worse in Montana. Montana Attorney General Austin Knutson says through June 30th, regional drug agents seized over 111,000 doses of fentanyl in Montana. That number's up from over 60,000 last year. We are just interdicting huge, huge shipments on the highways. But the staggering numbers just keep coming. Opioid related emergency calls up 57%. Cartels can make a fentanyl tablet, a, a counterfeit fentanyl tablet, south of the border in Mexico for pennies on the dollar. They can bring it to Montana and that tablet in certain areas of Montana is worth $100 or more for one tablet. Overdose deaths are now the leading cause of death for young adults and that number is only accelerating in Montana. That's why we're here. That market doesn't exist in most other places in the country. So in response, Knudsen says in order to fight this epidemic, it's going to have to come from a few different places. Uh, until we've got a handle on the southern border, I really feel like we're trying to treat a gunshot wound with a band-aid. Adding narcotics agents and drug dogs to the front lines. We're trying to get resources out of Helena and get it out to the areas where, where they're needed. All in an effort to keep Montana safe. 800% increase. It's looking like we're gonna leave those numbers in the dust again. Stay away from this stuff because it is so, so dangerous. And Wyoming law enforcement also stepping up their patrols as fentanyl infects local communities. In that state, we bring in our Diane Parker. You're digging into the numbers, so what can you tell us, Diane? Well, Andrea, the numbers, they are quite alarming. Now, let's go back to 2020 when Wyoming law enforcement sees just over 1,600 doses of fentanyl nearly a 4,000% increase over 20, 2019. Now it only gets worse from there. In 2021, officers confiscated almost 10,000 more doses, weighing in at 65 pounds. Now 2022 is not over yet, of course, and already 13,000 doses have been seized this year in the Cowboy State. And Andrea, more busts are likely coming. The Wyoming Highway Patrol trained its first fentanyl sniffing canine. Now the dog just started on the job this week. Yeah, that's interesting. We were talking about that yesterday. They actually have a, a dog dedicated to fentanyl. How interesting is that? Yeah, wow. it's interesting that now the canines are being trained for that. I talked with the Billings Police Department recently. They didn't have their canine uh, sniffing dog quite yet, but I know it's on the list. So it's something law enforcement are thinking about all across the country, really. Yeah, a lot of information on that. Okay, so Diane, you have a little bit more that you're working for a little bit later in the show. Talk to us about that. Right, well, I will be speaking with um, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Elsie Arnson, as Montana kids, they are getting ready to head on back to school. I know we have teacher shortages, also a lot of excitement just coming up for next week, so we will have all the latest on that. It is already that time. Yes, okay. it is. Sounds good. We'll see you soon, Diane. All right, see ya. The city of Billings continues moving toward a greener, more sustainable future. Now four new all-electric buses are replacing some of the older diesel vehicles in the fleet. As q Zelina Howder reports, more earth-conscious moves will also be coming soon. You see them all around town, but soon four of the city's buses will look a little different. Transit industry, honestly, has been moving towards electrics for 15 years. Billings has received more than $3 million in grants to make the change. The project, one of 150 chosen from across the country out of 530 applicants that were submitted. That grant does include funding for charging infrastructure, so upgrades to our facilities here uh, to put in 
couple chargers to keep those up and running. And Billings isn't alone. Many cities are transitioning to electric. Here in Montana, Missoula's Mountain Line Bus Service just received a $10 million grant to help the company add 10 more electric buses to the 12 they currently own. The goal? Reduce carbon emissions and improve service. We're looking at increasing frequency and hours of service with that. The buses aren't the only effort Billings has made to go green in recent years. 2020 and 2021, I think we did 28 uh, energy efficiency projects. A lot of those included LED lighting upgrades throughout city facilities, like fire stations, the library, parking garages, city hall, and much more. And even the dump has become more energy efficient. Public Works has had a partnership with MDU at the landfill since 2008. We reuse the methane that comes off the landfill. Uh, and we use it as renewable gas um, and put it into their pipeline. These are just a handful of the 112 energy efficiency projects the city has completed to become more sustainable, as yet another project is added to the list. In Billings, Alina Howder, MTN News. All right, we've got Miller here. Good morning to you. Morning. To 80s you, yeah. do feel a lot different than 90s. They, they sure do, yeah. And a little trying to get a little cooler today. Wow. Um, Red Lodge may not even get out of the 70s today. Wow. You lucky devils, you. <laughs> Well, what if I told you maybe this time next week we could be looking at some 70s? I think I would like that. There's a chance. We'll definitely take a look at that with the main forecast coming up. Step back in time yesterday, our high only got up to 87, so pretty much on target where we should be. Overnight low, though, milder than normal, got down to 62. Pretty quiet yesterday with the winds. We did have some breezy conditions at times. Top gust at 22. Of course, no rain yesterday for the month, holding steady over uh, just over four tenths of an inch of rain, uh, 12 inches for the year in terms of that moisture. So we're still sliding back a bit for the month, not too bad. For the year, we're still pacing ahead. On that note, the latest drought monitor came out yesterday. Most of us remaining unchanged. It did get drier, though, in western Montana. Mineral, Sanders, Beaverhead counties got a little drier. No change down in northern parts of Wyoming. Currently, 42 states are in some stage of drought that is affecting over 233 million acres of wow. U.S. crops. No rain in the forecast for us for this weekend, by the way. Beautiful sunrise this morning captured by the Stockman Bank weather cam. We're at 63 here at the airport. A lot of the area in the 50s. A lot of us in the 80s today getting more seasonal. We'll have a warm up and then maybe more rain and a cool down on the way. I'm excited for that. I think we're going to try and get outside and do something. Do yeah, some recreating a nice weekend. weekend. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of sunshine, so don't forget the sunscreen. You bet. I never do. I, I'm not good with the sun. <laughs> I'm I, bad too. I I'm just bad. go red. It yeah. happens. I'm like, yeah, OK. All right, Miller, <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you soon. OK. We're learning more about a frustrating crime trend. Trespassers are helping themselves to the homes of flood victims. So people with cabins along East Rosebud Lake have limited access to their property. The only road in is completely washed out, requiring a hike to get there. Criminal campers are taking advantage, hiking in and setting up shop on private property, even on one cabin's front porch. I was kind of floored when I heard about it, and um, it's just, you know, Montanans don't do that. It's not a Montana value just to simply trespass on people's property. It's, it's very obvious that it's private property. And nothing has been reported stolen or damaged, and homeowners say the problem will go away when that new road comes in. It's a project that is still, though, about a year away from being finished. And Yellowstone National Park officials are setting a timeline to reopen two entrance points. Officials say the road to Cook City and the north entrance from Gardner should be drivable again mid-October. October 15th is aggressive. This happened June, middle, middle of June. Uh, Yellowstone's busy in June. Um, a million people a month come to Yellowstone in the summer months. Getting that park reopened was vital. The park was able to get 90% of Yellowstone open weeks after all five entrances were shut down due to flooding. This is something that we're following. Authorities in Yellowstone National Park investigating the discovery of a severed human foot that was found floating in a hot spring. The foot was still inside of a shoe when it was pulled from the abyss pool in the West Thumb Geyser Basin. That section of the park is now back open today after it was closed. Officers are still though in the early stages of investigating. They don't know how the foot got there. Oh, new this morning, the nation is a step closer to seeing the affidavit that allowed FBI agents to search former President Trump's Florida home. A judge now says the Justice Department must file a redacted version of the document. CBS's Bradley Blackburn has the details. 
Federal Magistrate Judge Bruce Reinhardt is giving the Justice Department one week to propose redactions to the affidavit, which led to the search of President Trump's residence in Mar-a-Lago. Judge Reinhardt seemed to have a very good uh, sense that it is his job as the gatekeeper in this case to perform his function of balancing the interest in the public of accessing these materials against the interest in the government in keeping them secret. On Thursday, attorneys representing media organizations, including CBS News, asked the judge to make parts of the affidavit behind the search warrant public. The Justice Department pressed for it to be sealed, arguing that its release would undermine an investigation that's still in its early stages. For the most part, we're not going to see the core of what we're all very interested in, none of which will be good news for former President Trump. The development comes a little more than a week after the FBI seized classified and top secret information during the search. In other Trump legal woes, the former chief financial officer of the Trump Organization pleaded guilty to not paying taxes on $1.5 million in compensation. Alan Weisselberg could now be called to testify if a case against the Trump Organization goes to trial. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, New York. The Justice Department argues making the affidavit public could expose and prevent witnesses from coming forward and cooperating with that investigation. Trump, though, is calling for the release of the full unredacted affidavit in the interest of transparency. We are all waiting for inflation to improve. Our reporter Joe St. George takes a look at when and how that might happen. You know, we reporters are always looking for the truth. After all, if there's one thing politicians are good at, it's political spin. Well, Here's the truth about inflation and the newly signed Inflation Reduction Act. Actually reducing inflation is going to take some time, and it may have nothing to do with the law that President Biden signed earlier this week. In fact, the University of Pennsylvania's Penn Wharton budget model, which is a widely respected economic predictor, says the act would have no meaningful effect on inflation in the near term. One reason, many of the bill's policy changes, like prescription drug reform, don't begin for several years. Thank you. The president disagrees, believing the new law will have an impact because it decreases the deficit. White House aides have told reporters they believe lower deficits have historically helped reduce inflation. Regardless, the current inflation rate sits at around 8.5%. That means if you spent $100 in goods and services last year at this time, you're paying around $8.50 more for those same services. Currently, most economic forecasts have inflation getting back to 2 to 4%, which is more normal by the end of next year. But those forecasts say that only happens if the economy keeps slowing down. A slowing economy has drawbacks, though. For instance, companies may be less inclined to hire new employees or offer a pay raise if profits won't be as high. Higher interest rates right now mean debt, like mortgages, is more costly. Expect the inflation fight to be at the center of this year's midterm election. Many Republicans are campaigning on cutting taxes and government spending to help fight inflation. Democrats are campaigning on policies to offset the cost of inflation, like limiting how much child care costs or providing new child tax credits as the country waits for inflation to improve. Gas prices have impacted a lot of things. Some Americans are making some big changes. I recently met Christine Brett. I purchased a different vehicle because I had better gas mileage than my SUV. In Washington, I'm Joe St. George.